Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say right now that this didn't happen last night, this voice. It's been coming on slowly. I was very well behaved last night, so don't believe any, anything you hear. And I am a North Melbourne supporter, nine in a row. How good's that? We come from opposite ends of the spectrum on the panel, which is really good. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is what we're doing as an industry. Um, my portfolio is for both the CRC and APL. Um, the antimicrobial usage and stewardship is a very big part of it. Um, and your levies pay for it. So we try to make decisions on your behalf with the knowledge that we have to best prepare industry because a lot of it is about risk management. And, you know, we know that um, we've got a bad rap with antibiotics. Um, I don't know what these people that think that we drive up, you know, be double full of drugs and just dump them into our feeders and the pigs eat them. What do they think that costs us? How do they think that would happen? But nevertheless, we have had a bad rap. But if you look at uh, that's with Australia, that's defined daily dose for people. So Australia in terms of antibiotic usage in humans is right up there as well. And really if you look at what the animal industries use compared to what's used in the human population, um, on a weight for weight basis, there are much greater amounts used in human medicine. And we haven't even started talking about companion animals that are treated like children, a lot of them by their owners, or well, we tend to do with our dogs, I know that, they have the run of the house. But the time has come over the last few years to stop pointing the finger at each other and to take a coordinated approach. We're all in this together and we need to find solutions together. But I'd just like to stop and explain just subtle differences between antimicrobials and antibiotics because I think they're important um, and too often we think of resistance associated just with antibiotics but the field is much wider than that. Now that plate up there actually shows a, a penicillin growth and you can see the bacteria growth around the end, nothing's come forward. So that's an antibiotic, it's produced by a microorganism, it has the ability to stop growth, retard growth, or, or to actually kill the bug. Um, but antimicrobials are other products that can also kill, stop growth um, of microorganisms. And they include things such as disinfectants, um, very popular disinfectant human and, and farm but also things such as copper sulphate, zinc sulphate, that are used to try and control, well, zinc sulphate, um, scours. They can be considered an antimicrobial as well, so it's important to remember this. And where are we at as an industry? Well, over the last few years, we've invested a lot of resources, time, money, blood, sweat and tears, into trying to build programs that are answering some of these questions. Because I think it's important not to, you know, go off half-cocked and just spend money on whatever. We needed to identify the risks and we needed to find out what was going on so we can adequately address this problem, because otherwise we're just going to be making mistakes and wasting money. And all these things build into our antimicrobial portfolio. So I'd like to talk about APIC first. That's a, it's a really good program. It, it's not perfect, but it's really good. Um, as a pig producer, and we also produce prime lambs, we were LPA accredited for our prime lambs, and I had a, a robust discussion with a food regulator regarding the non-inclusion of APIC into a food standards portfolio, because he deemed it to be similar to LPA. Well, you know, with APIC, you have a... We, my APIC, first APIC manual was, I think, about 18 pages long, and when we finally finished up with pigs, it took up about a whole bookshelf. My LPA accreditation I received by going on the computer and ticking a box, and it's become more robust now 
but APIC is a very, very good system. And one of the modules in APIC is food safety. And that really um, has quite a lot to do with antibiotics because it includes a herd health plan. You have to have a pig vet practitioner. And our treatments, which has amazed human medicine professionals when I tell them, we're required to keep treatment records, the weight of the pigs, how often they're treated. Um, and that records have got to be kept for some time. And, you know, even the intensive care unit, a, a sow sheet, and some people have similar treatment sheets for grower pigs. So all this goes to building, uh, I guess, a record of what we're actually doing. The other thing is the food safety and biosecurity plan. Biosecurity is a big part of what we do. We're all terrified of uh, even an endemic disease coming onto our farm that we don't have. We know what happens when diseases can break, but definitely an exotic animal disease. And what we do in our biosecurity plan is to try to maintain the health of our animals and the welfare of our animals. Because anyone that's seen a bad outbreak of even scours um, know how much an animal can suffer and we don't want that to happen. And the research that is ongoing is really between the two, I guess, the main research providers, um, APL Specialist Group 4 and Heather Channon's the secretariat of that group. And it's all about food safety, but I've really highlighted biosecurity and quality assurance and program two of the High Integrity Australian Pork CRC, which is enhancing animal health while re reducing antibiotics. So we're doing some very, very good work in that area. And I've just basically divided it up to, you know, biosecurity and enhancing health. And you can see that with biosecurity, a lot of it's about risk, managing risk, determining risk, quantifying it, and, and having a de defence plan. Whereas in enhancing health is trying to find strategies, you know, novel vaccines, which can be really hard, um, measuring antibiotic usage, and just developing a better understanding of what's going on between this, you know, bug, pig, environment interaction. Because it's not as simple as, you know, bacteria comes along, here's a pig and the pig gets sick. It's, it can be very, very complicated. And if we have a better understanding of, of what's going on there, we can make better decisions. So our tool chest is becoming quite, quite good. It's you know really come along from what we had previously. We've got uh, antimicrobial usage and recording and biosecurity in our farm QA. We have a better understanding because we've spent quite a bit of money on looking at risk analyses of exotic disease pathogens as well as the endemic ones. We've had a few more diagnostic tools and the time I spent in the United States made me very envious of the diagnostic tools they had available because at that time we just received one for APP and we just thought, oh, that's just fantastic. And they had everything that opens and shuts. We now have the ability to measure antibiotic usage on farm. It's very basic, but a number of farms have taken it up and it's, it's good. We're actually doing it. We have alternative interventions like um, disinfectant fogging to reduce pathogen load in the environment, so it reduces the chance of the pigs becoming infected. And we have now antimicrobial resistance surveillance protocols, and I, I'd just like to spend a bit of time on that because I think this is very important because, as Peter pointed out, it's the, the verification of all the other things we do um, is really ticked off by the surveillance. And we've got a project running at the moment. Um, it's 200 samples taken at slaughter. It's all around Australia, and we're just collecting the cecum and taking it to the lab. And we're estimating um, the antimicrobial resistance in the commensals. Now, commensals are just the bugs that live in, live in the gut. It's different to, like, if you've got a sick pig, you take a sample or a swab, and they recover the bug that's causing all the problems. These bugs live there, and they're not causing any problems. So they're the ones that are always chosen, well, mostly, to try and do antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And there are four groups. There's E. coli, Salmonella, Enterococcus, and Campylobacter. Like, 
there was a bit of a stuff up with the first lot of samples, so we have to repeat it. But um, that happens sometimes in research, but it's going along quite well. And uh, Darren Trott and Sam Abraham have been involved in that, and we're going to have some wonderful information from that. But when we started talking about this project, we were quite concerned, and the concern was raised after talking to people like Sam and Darren, that it's not enough to know, is it resistant against this antimicrobial or this one, yes or no? That doesn't give us a full story, because we know resistance can be quite a complicated story, and we really wanted to know where it came from, because we want to know if we can stop it from coming in. That's, that's very important to try and track it. And I'm just going to give, you know, just a short snippet about resistance, and I apologise to the people that have already seen these slides. But resistance doesn't only occur because we use an antibiotic. Yeah, it, it can occur from that, and it does, but that's not the only mechanism. Some bacteria are naturally resistant to certain antibiotics because it's a survival mechanism. It's like when we sweat when it gets hot or we shiver when it gets cold, it's the way back bacteria try to survive. Heavy metals like zinc, copper, and uh, Darren will pick up some really interesting stuff as well in his talk, promote the spread of antibiotic resistance via co-selection because they're, they're linked on the genetic material. So that was a bit scary when we started to realise things like that. But bacteria can also become resistant through either genetic mutation or picking up resistance from other bacteria because um, that's just what they do. And if you look at the way, you know, from, from genetic mutation, if you start off with a bacteria that's resistant to an antibiotic, okay, they grow like bacteria do and they can grow really quickly, most of them. And then a sp spontaneous mutation occurs and this mutation perhaps renders the bug resistant to this antibiotic. So all the other bacteria will die that don't have this mutation and this one will thrive. So in time, these bacteria um, are resistant to that antibiotic. Or the other way, because they can pick up resistance from other bacteria. Uh, bacteria don't really know about safe sex and these little plasmids, they call them promiscuous genetic elements, which I think is pretty funny. But the plasmids are part of the survival DNA, I guess, and Dar Darren explains it much better than I do. But, but the plasmids are, are separate to the genetic DNA of the, of the bacteria, and they copy and transfer. So if you've got a bacteria that is resistant to, say, uh, penicillin, it can copy and transfer it over to another bacteria, but that bacteria doesn't have to be the same type. It can swap between different bugs in the gut. So, so that is one of the issues we have. And these plasmids also encode for more than one antibacterial class. And Sam Abraham has picked up a bacteria, oh, sorry, a plasmid, and typed it. And that actually encodes for eight different antibiotics all linked on the same plasmid. And this is important to remember because I'll, with the information I'll be giving you next. And for example, fluoroquinolones. We've seen fluoroquinolone resistance at very, very low levels, admittedly, but we, we've picked it up on four different isolates. Why are we seeing it? Fluoroquinolones have never been registered for food animal use in Australia. They're not really even used in, in companion animals. So is someone using them illegally? No. But how are they ending up in the pigs? Well, my learned colleagues really think they're coming in, they're being brought into the piggery through animals, birds, other things perhaps. And so what does this mean? Well, the fluoroquinolone resistance is one of those, uh, I guess, mutations that are carried on the DNA. So it's, they've really, this bacteria's really got it and it's, it's not going to go anywhere soon. And 
what they found is that it has been tracked in. And now we're just trying to find out how it's been tracked in. But there are papers that show that even seagulls have this fluoroquinolone resistance. And uh, I've never seen a vet down at Seaside giving fluoroquinolones to, to seabirds. So they've picked it up from somewhere. And, you know, this is just a picture of starlings over a piggery. Um, you know, one of the recommendations for biosecurity is to have bird food proof uh, window openings. Ibises, anyone who's got... Um, in Victoria that's got their effluent being spread on the ground would have had visits from ibises wandering through the effluent system. I used to think they were very noble birds until I saw them do that and I lost all respect after that. <laughs> but I'd like to also talk about another type of resistance and carbapenins. And Pete had a, more than one reference to carbapenins in his, um, in his slides. Carbapenins are a very important um, antibiotic that is used in the treatment of quite serious infections in humans. Um, they're not used in food animals at all. They're not really used in companion animals, except as the drug of last choice when they've got a, a terrible infection that they can't control. But resistance for these carbapenins is, is carried on these highly transferable plasmids. And like you know, that doesn't, that just turns the stomach, I know, but we have our, our animals, well, like, like I know at home, our dogs, they live in the house, they jump up on the couch, much to my husband's disgust, but they live very closely with us and it wouldn't be hard for a, a bacteria to transfer like that. And we work quite closely with pigs, you know, we do manuals on them, we pick up scouring pigs, we, we, we're in very close contact. So transfer from companion animals to humans to livestock is a possibility. And if these carbapenin resistant bacteria ever enter the livestock population, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because, as I said before, these highly transferable plasmids, they can encode for more, more than one antimicrobial. And if we're treating with an antimicrobial that is one of the ones on these plasmids, that selection pressure will keep the carbapenin resistance in our pig population. Withdraw the selection pressure, and Darryl, Darryl, uh, Darren tells a much better story than I do. Um, it, it's expensive for the bacteria to keep them there. So as soon as you re remove that selection pressure, they'll get rid of it, because it costs them quite a lot to keep them there. So we can potentially revert back to a susceptible bacterial population. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think we've always talked of um, biosecurity protocols in terms of keeping diseases out, but I think we also have to look at them in terms of, you know, transmission or carriage of these antimicrobial resistance bacteria, because they are going to cost us a lot. And stewardship, well, I'd like to talk, this is where stewardship comes in. It's the careful and responsible management of something precious entrusted to one's care. And I'm not Daryl Kerrigan, but this is a really good story. And we need to remember that what we've got is something that we want to keep using. It's not that I'm saying that we should stop using antimicrobials altogether. We need to keep them for when we need them. And antibiotics should only be one of our tools. They're not, you know, and it's definitely on a need to use basis, not have to use. It's not miracle mycin or magic mycin and, you know, it won't fix a broken roof that you should have fixed a couple of weeks ago. And it's not a safety blanket. We can't use it to try and protect us from something that may or may not come. And it's definitely not a silver bullet. So when I talk about antimicrobial stewardship, I'm talking about the preservation of antimicrobials for the future, not only for our animals but for us, because we're in this all together. And it's to reduce the emergence of these antimicrobial resistant strains of bacteria so that when we have them, they work. And it needs to be an ongoing process. It's not something like, you know, a dead document, set and forget. We'll keep building onto it as more information becomes available. And it links all of us, because one of the things that used to drive me really 
mad is when people say to you, you know, you don't care, use your stuff, you're not part of the community. We're all part of the community. You know, we have children, we have families. We want everyone to be healthy. We want our food to be safe to eat. Of course we're part of the solution. So I think what our antimicrobial stewardship program will entail, and um, what I've neglected to say, was this is identified as one of our priorities in Specialist Group 4. And we have some money now towards this, and we are in um, discussion with the other intensive, or two of the other intensive livestock industries, chicken meat, and the livestock feeders uh, as well. And we are trying to get together to come up with a framework document for antimicrobial stewardship. And then each industry will populate it with the tools they need. And that'll include a lot of the things I talked about today. We're also uh, talking with the, Anim the Australian Veterinary Association and the Therapeutics Guideline Group. Um, and that will go in it as well. So it's the big picture stuff. It's some, it, everything that we'll need. And it'll look at integrated management and, and animal husbandry, interventions such as vaccines or, you know, um, all in, all out, a really good one. Uh, antibiotics is still part of the solution and records because, you know, no one, you can't put your hand on your heart anymore and say, trust me, I'm a farmer or trust me, I'm a doctor. Um, you've got to be able to show the proof. People want proof. And antimicrobial resistance surveillance will be part of this because it provides a verification, um, not only for the community, but I think for us, that what we're doing is working, that we need to keep a check of what's going on. And Darren will talk more about that because right now it's quite expensive, but we're trying to find a way to make it cheaper so people can do it as just an ongoing diagnostic tool. Because that will be the way that we maintain a, a healthy herd. Like it's not, it's not just one thing. We've got all these little things that come together. It's a, a jigsaw puzzle, whatever you like to call it. But it's the one percenters, all those wonderful, you know, buzzwords that we use, but that's a fact. Um, if you, you do all these things correctly, we will end up with the, um, the animals well, healthy, and in, in good welfare, I guess. And that's, that's the talk. Thank you. change in the way that we, um, when I say we, I mean production animal industries, um, in, in the way that we approach animal health management, um, maybe even biosecurity and antimicrobial stewardship, um, it, we know that one efficient way to change behaviours and therefore culture is uh, the implementation of policy and regulation, whether that be uh, at a, uh, a government level or an industry level. Um, so we have this existing platform, APIC. Uh, which considers animal health management and uh, the use of veterinary chemicals. Um, is there a system or a mechanism built into APIC that allows, allows for sort of the assessment of data, uh, the interpretation of that data, and then maybe the exchange of dialogue uh, around, let's just say, drug usage? Um, how, I'm not, not intimately yeah. familiar with APIC, I apologise, um, yeah. so I'm not sure quite how it works. Uh, the APIC. Pardon me, if you're in APIC, you have to have a, a, a good relationship. You have to have a, a, a pig a vet. Um, and they have to provide the recommendations for treatment. But I must admit, I would not want to see something like this regulated. Um, I think it's important to have records because people want to see records. You know, it's not just enough to say, I'm doing it, don't worry about it. We've got, we've got it. Don't worry about it. But I think the coming from, from what I, I believe, and over time, I guess things like this do get audited, I would like to just see it become part of piggery culture, that people do it like, you know, doing calibrations on your AI fridge, you know, go and take a calibration, see if it's working properly. To me, that's what, you know, surveillance is. Surveillance is just keeping a check on what's going on. And antimicrobial usage, the way we talk about it, it's for benchmarking too, because everyone knows what they spend on drugs. But it would be really good to pinpoint it, and if you make changes on farm by 
you know, a new ventilation system or a brand new shed or something like that, just to keep track on what it's actually meant to you as a producer. Um, we could, I guess it'd be easy enough to put it into, once we, we got sign off with the, with the board and the producers, if that's what they wanted to do, um, because there are some of the things in there now, but I think right now just, it would be good just to make it part of, you know, what people want to do because they think it, it'll be good for them and good for the industry. So I don't know if that answers your question though, Mitch. Okay. Sort of. <laughs> It not be too hard, Sheffy. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be that hard. Uh, probably would be a bit difficult to answer, but uh, <laughs> it's good to know that, as you mentioned, that there are some progressive farmers that they want to know their antimicrobial usage and you know, they want to monitor it. But, you know, it's, I think it's a bit hard as well to monitor on the farm because sometimes, you know, they forget to keep the record or, you know, some farmers, maybe they just not in their interest or something. Um, how about if we think about the other option to start from veterinarian? There will be only a few veterinarian or, you know, to start this initiative if they prescribe any antibiotics to certain farms and then they can send it, a copy to whatever the body is. Yeah. So this way we can track it out. Have you ever thought about it, if that yeah. is feasible? Um, it is possible, but the reason why it was decided to go on farm, and really the, the on farm usage is very simple. It's based on... Um, um, antibiotic invoices in, which everyone gets invoices for the antibiotics or stuff you buy from the veterinarian. And the other thing it's based on is pigs killed and the weight of the pig. So it's not, while you have to record antibiotic usage for um, APIC, you've got to record treatments and things like that. Um, this, is us this is based on antibiotics that come in, in farm and the pig weights that go out. So there's no, it, we had to find a way of recording that that was suitable to all farms, because not everyone weighs their pigs, uh, much as, you know, it would be good. It, it would have to be something that was common to all farms, and that what was decided that was common. Everyone gets, everyone knows what they pay for antibiotics, and I, the great majority of people would get kill sheets from their abattoirs so they know what they're killing. And then that's just entered into a spreadsheet. We found that that would be the best way because it was the farmers were really keen to do it, and some of the veterinarians were. It was it's going to be quite difficult, and it entered into client customer privilege. So this was this was much better, and the producers also felt like they had some control over it, um, and they were seeing what was going out. So yeah, we we did think about it, but it was. Um, at initially, you know, we had people saying, oh, it would be too hard, just another job we have to do. But when they realised how simple it could be, um, because I set up all the spreadsheets for them, it's, it's very, very easy. And it's not at the start, it's a little bit out, because especially if the vets have something on special, you know, like vaccines or, or uh, an antibiotic comes on special, they'll buy it in bulk. So you get, you know, really high peaks, but over time you get a much better... Thing. But yeah, that was a very good question. Um, Pat, if I could, two parts to the question, the uh, theme similar. You, you talk about antibiotics and antimicrobials. In the antibiotics, is there actually the thought of splitting it to therapeutic versus um, non-therapeutic? And then the second part of my question is relating to stewardship and communication. Uh, last night I saw on ABC Rural uh, it, it's related to the beef sector, but it, it could just as easily happen here. Yeah. We get an ABC report that says if you feed uh, tetracyclines to cattle, you get increased greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions. We're not feeding tetracyclines to beef cattle every day of the week. So you, you, this media reporting is, yeah. is really an issue. So they're the two questions, if you don't mind. Um, they're both very good questions. It's, it's very hard to split um, the UC... Oh, the usage into, I guess, therapeutic and non-therapeutic because different farms have different practices. Um, the, what we do do is we split it into, um, you know, fee-based injectables and water-based. 
So that we do do that. The other thing we also do is we also take note of additional things that could be used, like uh, acids in the water or acids in the feed, um, vaccines, uh, things of that nature as well. Because what we're trying to build up is a picture of what's going on farm and also a list of the endemic diseases. So while the antibiotic usage calculator is part of it, we also have some, you know, to, to have a little bit of a story if we needed to, because it, it's very hard to take, well, you can, you can take antibiotic usage completely out but antibiotic usage happens because of things that are going on on farm. So it's important to get a, a bit of a picture. So that's what we have done. Um, I don't know if you saw, talking about the ABC, the Catalyst program on the ABC, and about, I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you the link if you like. It was very good and it was very, it was very measured and it was quite fair when you considered the shellacking we usually get. Um, we try to keep in contact. When that Catalyst program went to air, I'd been talking with the producers for uh, a number of weeks, and we were trying to get them to come onto a farm and actually talk to a producer. They, they spoke to Mary Barton, and I think she was at Roseworthy, and Mary gave a, a really good account of what was going on. But I also provided them with a, a lot of information. And we have uh, media, I guess, responses for when things go on that we can supply them with. But at the end of the day, sometimes you can provide them with all the information in the world and they will write what they will write. And there are people that we are wary of because of that. And it's not only the ABC or other reporters, sometimes it's, um, it's other people that, you know, should know better and that are within, you know, um, the scientific system that also create some havoc for us sometimes because the reasons people say these things are not to sell newspapers or news, sometimes it's to get grant funding. And no one in this room is guilty of that, let me say. Um, you know, Darren and uh, Sam both have the interests of the industry at heart and they are very passionate about um, what they do and about protecting us and providing us with the best support possible. So does that answer your question? Oh, that's good. Thank you.